So now we deal with Frank O'Hara's A Step Away From Them, and arguably one of his most famous poems. Fantastic. There's no way that we're going to do justice to it. So let's just say some broad things about it first. Um, this is another lunch poem. Do we know that for sure? It says it. Yep. It's my, it's lunch, my lunch hour. hour. Okay. And, and the frame uh, works at the end. Does he go back to work at the end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What's he got with him when he goes back to work? Poems in his pocket. Yeah. What is the significance of poems in his pocket, Anna? Um, well, he clearly is someone who reads a lot as much as he writes. And, you know, he tells you exactly who he's reading. So if you wanted to, uh, like I did, you know, you could look up Pierre Reverdy and you can figure out what kind of poems he writes. Um, and I okay. found out that Pierre Reverdy is someone who wrote kind of surrealist sort of dreamy poems. Yeah, real influence on the New York school poets. Yep. Okay, so what is it, but what is the, contra is there any contrast between the lunchtime activity of New York um, and the bookishness? Interesting, isn't it? Well, everything kind of external to him is super hyper hyperactive and dynamic. Um, but his heart, uh, nevertheless, is this book of poems, which is still at least as at least the book as an object itself, um, regardless of you know uh, what the manner of the poetry. Um, but there is a kind of nice. Um, I don't know, juxtaposition in that, those two different energies. It's a juxtaposition, right? You have this, this urban, diverse, thrilling, beautiful scene of activity and doing, and then you have, you know, and then he comes back to work with his, with his book. So it's either a contrast or the book is part of the fullness of life. In fact, the, the poem begins to evidence the kind of, you know, the, the writing that comes from the reading that he does. Okay, diversity. What kind of diversity do we have here? Lots going on. I'm Reese. Um, there is racial diversity. He discusses the Puerto Ricans. There's the Negroes. What did you say the about the Puerto Ricans? Um, several Puerto Ricans several, on the avenue today. Which makes it beautiful and warm. And um, so it's positive. He feels that this adds to the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's referencing, I guess, the influx of immigrants that was Certainly, um, yeah. significant at the this time. This poem was written in 1956, included in the book Lunch Poems later, but it's a, it's a 50s poem. Any other kinds of diversity? Economic diversity. Mm -hmm. We go from, uh, we have workers, and then we also have um, the, the Negro, presumably uh, poor, just standing in the doorway, unemployed, and then we also have the woman... Well, he's languorously agitating. It's not clear what agitating means. It's, it could be a door guy or a... Could be a door guy, oh, could, huh. be a, could be someone with nothing to do, could be a guy on lunch break waiting for the chorus girls sure. to let out. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, we have the woman in the, with the foxes, uh, clearly wealthy. Wealthy woman who's showing off her wealth. How is she showing it off? With her furs. Yeah, she's wearing summer. a fo fox fur in the summer. Maybe so like a stole. It's conspicuous consumption. At the Is there same any time, other? Go at ahead, the same Dave. Time, I was just going to say at the same time he's shopping for bargain rich wrist, wrist watches, and he points out later that there's a woman with furs on. Yeah, and he's getting a cheeseburger and a malted, which is, sounds like a great lunch to me, but you know <laughs> it's not exactly a high end thing. Um, is there any other conspicuous consumption going on here? A glass of papaya juice. Papaya juice? I don't know yeah. how conspicuous. <laughs> that well, sounds like fun too. I mean, it's kind of exotic <laughs> and uh, striking to me. Any other? Uh, He's probably not going to papaya juice at the same any place. Any other, <laughs> any other excessive, <laughs> excessive consumption? In Times Square, the uh, the sign that blows smoke over his head—that's an advertisement. So he's. You know, it's garish about. for sure, but ne neon in daylight is a great pleasure. Why is that true? I mean, I assume you all think it's true, even though it's not very green and environmental. This is the 50s, after all. Kind of references that city never sleeps sort of quality of New York. That, you know, even in the middle of the daylight, we're, gonna have, we're still going to have our neon sign, which you totally don't need. It's so excessive. You totally don't need it. It's so excessive. Why is it a pleasure? Molly, why is it a pleasure, neon in daylight? Maybe because it signals, um, like, economic stability. It signals that sort of burgeoning post-war, like, we can afford to do this. Yeah, and Times Square is kind of... Uh, 
you know, ground zero for garishness and for advertising and for, in fact, the mixing of classes, which I think he's very, very excited about. Um, what kind of uh, tents are we using here again? New York School Poet tents. Emily? Present. Simple present. Okay, simple present. Do we get any continuous? Present continuous? The one time we get it is weird. Then onto the avenue where skirts are flipping above heels and blow up over grates. What's that a reference to? Uh, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, can you say a little more specific about the reference? And give way if you don't, you know, if you run out of knowledge. It's just an iconic sort of sexualized image, which has something of a, a kind of voyeurism in it, this woman revealing herself accidentally. Right, so Billy Wilder created a film, Seven Year Itch, in 1955. The poem was written in 1956, and Marilyn Monroe is asked to, I guess she strolls over a grate. What kind of grate? Subway. Subway, Subway grate. So rush presumably of air the rush up. of air, presumably hot air, comes up from below and you know, excited, excitingly, her, her skirt flips up and she, she spreads it back down, flipping up above heels and blow over grates. What, first of all, that's not happening on the day that he's having lunch. Or maybe it is, specifically, but she doesn't. He says, then on to the avenue where skirts are flipping above heels. It's this interesting kind of like almost dismemberment of the skirts and the heels and the grates where, you know, you have... You know, in other places in the poem, you have the blonde chorus girl clicks, you have the woman in, in foxes, but the skirts are not assigned to a specific person. Right. It's just kind they're of like, apart. they're, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a kind of weird it's a, disjunction. It's a distant relative of pounds, the, the hand of the, the yeah. hand of the woman is, mm -hmm. who is likened um, and created into an object. Um, but this is going on. This is the continuous present. They are flipping. What an unusual way to do the continuous present tense. This is what happens. And that follows another somewhat sexual scene. Yeah? Yeah, the, the glistening torsos of the laborers. Yeah, so they too, they feed their glistening torsos <laughs> sandwiches and Coke, wearing yellow hel helmets. And then he either teasingly or actually confesses not to knowing why they wear yellow helmets. To, they protect them from falling bricks, I guess. What's the gist of that? So you get those two sexual scenes. So I, I don't mean sexual, but you know, sexualized objects. Amaris, you're an expert on this. <laughs> Am I? Um, <laughs> um, the problem is I didn't read it as, I mean, I read it as erotic, but I also read it as vaguely ominous. The idea of the yellow helmets, which he says protect their heads from falling bricks, I guess it seems to reference both um, further down in the poem when he talks about his dead friends as well as the title. He says a step away from, it seems like a step away from danger, a step away from return and mm. fate. Mm. Um, this is different from The Day Lady Died, how? Both of them are I do this, I do that poems, but this is different. This is more of just a walk. This is finding beauty in everything without you know, that, that deeper meaning of, uh, of an elegy. This well, I think that's true of Day Lady Died, except for the elegiac part. But there's another difference. Anybody? I mean, this seems more socioeconomic to me. Mm -hmm. I, I read A Step Away From Them as him being separated from the people. I mean, these are all different types of people, but he's not one of any. Yes, of that's groups. a big difference. In the other poem, he talks about the preparations for his weekend at the Hamptons, what he does. Right. Here, this is not about, he, you know, he does looking, he goes for a walk, but really other than that kind of, you know, necessary narrative stuff, he's looking at what other people do. This is what he sees. I want to read you what Ginsburg said about this poem and about O'Hara. He integrated purely personal life into the high art of composition, marking the return of all authority back to the person. His style is actually in line with the tradition that begins with independence, capital I, meaning the Declaration of Independence, and runs through Thoreau and Whitman, here composed in a metropolitan space age architecture environment. He taught me, this is Ginsburg saying of O'Hara, he taught me to really see New York for the first time by making of the giant style of Midtown his intimate cocktail environment. What do you make of what Ginsburg said there, other than that it's a very generous appreciation 
from the beat over to the New York school. What do you make of that? Who am I going to put on the spot here? Max, what do you make of that comment? The return of all authority back to the person. Well, he also says that, that O'Hara uh, helped him see New York for the first yeah. time. Yeah. And there's definitely a way in which, with this sort of flanning, he's also, he's, he's showing us things, he's seeing things, but he's also sort of picking them apart a little bit. Um, and, and showing us uh, all these elements that, that, that together compose the, the tableau of New York and that there's the yellow hats and that's somehow different from, from just like a, from just a helmet that a, or a hard hat that a construction worker would wear. Where there's, there's neon and daylight um, that uh, remarkably redundant detail. Um, yeah, he's, he's, it's, he's sort of just unstitching things. And what is Whitmanian about this? Not so much Thoreauvian, I would say, but American, Independence Day American type, is that because of the parataxis, because of the listy quality of this thing, everything has equal significance. It's implicitly liberal and plurist, pluralistic without being political in a didactic sense. And then you get ruminations on those we've lost, Young, Bunny, John Latouche, Jackson Pollock, and then this beautiful question, but is the earth as full as life was full of them? I'm not even going to try to have us paraphrase that. You know, what's remarkable for me about that is, and this is, this is why I think the day lady died kind of like touches me so much, mm -hmm. as, as you have, he's going through about his day, all this incidental stuff that he's seeing and observing. And I mean, I think that's where the authority comes in. It's because, you know, I'm going to digress a little bit, but I'm going to go with it. Howell, I don't think there's a lot of authority in Howell, the way that Ginsburg writes it, because he's writing about his generation and he's describing in every way that he can the best minds of his generation and what they went through. But there's not a lot of I in that. There's a lot of we. Mm -hmm. But here, this is all I. This is I look, I see, you know, down the avenue in Times Square. I, and then, I I'm sorry, you were going to make another point? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to actually get back to the question that you asked me originally. That's all right. Um, and then he gets to, you know, kind of thinking about his friends that he's lost. Ah, nice. I was going to go there, too. There is a res restoration of the we. Yeah. Um, these are his people. Uh, these are influences. These are important to him. And it's and like he, these thoughts just, like, come out in, this, in a kind of day. You're just, like, strolling along, having your nice lunch break. You're all full of yummy cheeseburger. And then you're thinking about first Bunny died and then John Latouche and then Jackson Pollock and... There's, so you know, the ruminations lead neither to sadness or, nor happiness, but to an affirmation of his place in the teeming city world. And I would say, by way of concluding here, I think this is a really important point. Um, you think about the importance of these artists and their relationship to New York or to the city, to the modern city, to modernity, I guess I would say, right? And then you think about something incidental, like looking at the Manhattan storage warehouse and repeating the mistake that you had made, thinking that the armory show, the great armory show, which introduced modern art to New York, especially in 1913, what showed there in 1913? Isn't that where New Descending a Staircase showed? And William Carlos and Williams Fountain went to it show. <laughs> and said, Williams went in there and he said, I just looked at the art and I laughed with glee. I just laughed and laughed, Williams said. Laugh the the freedom of that kind of antic feeling like New York gives me modernity. So the idea that we lose our young artists, but that New York both has the sadness of the, of the warehouse that's soon to be torn down to make way for something even more modern and new. The mistake of having thought that the armory show was once there and therefore the mistake of thinking that modernism is being torn down for urban renewal. And so are the young artists who didn't get to flower completely, who are gone now. Instead of thinking that modernism is gone, you know, and that, and that art is dead, you turn to New York itself and realize that the source of your art is maintained in a place like this. So that the stepping away from them turns, and the, and, and the loss of these people, turns out in the end to be the affirmation that it's the place, it's the energy and diversity of the place 
that made modern art possible and that continues to do so. And so you get your papaya juice and you get your reverdi and you go back to work. <laughs>